in committee meetings onto YouTube. So this meeting will be recorded and broadcast. And by the time you get home, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. What's being recorded is the slide deck. And then anything that we say, there are two microphones in the front. So if you do ask a question, please use your outside voice. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. My name is Matt Fredrickson. I'm the IT director, Council Rock School District. My cohort, Tom Range, he's going to co-chair this committee. I have a. I'm going to try to tell you tonight the slides. No, I'm just kidding. Tonight's meeting is really just an introduction to what the purpose of the committee is for. So what I'd like to do at this time is just kind of go around the table and just give me your name and kind of your background. If you're a teacher or an administrator or if you're in the community. Just kind of give us an idea of, of why you're here, other than the fact that I sent you an email and you said yes. So we'll start with Laura. Um, I'm Laura Kelly. I'm an speech therapist at Goodno. And I'm here because I'm really passionate about integrating technology education and making the daily life easier. I'm Mary Ann Malicious. I teach at Goodno. I'm also a member of the community. And I just came to here with Ron. Hi, I'm Shana Jackson, and um, I'm staff development. That's good enough. Okay. <laughs> I'm here with the directions are outside. And I'm here because I love technology, I love math. Is that what you're supposed to say? I love math. We better hear this way, I can't talk. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Robbie Berger, uh, superintendent of schools. Great to see everyone, and thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Williams. I am a parent and uh, in a lot of meetings for the district the last couple of years, and I just thought this sounded like something. Let's see what's going on. Um, Allie Ray Penn, I am PTO president at Newtown Middle School and at Council Rock North. And at the middle school, we integrated a 3D STEM printing program last year, and we're looking to see different ways that we can maybe integrate more technology and STEM education into the middle school. Uh, Steve McGill, I'm a citizen, live in uh, Holland. Uh, I have uh, about 40 years in healthcare, some of it in technology, including starting up an IT department uh, my company. I was 6 o'clock when I started. I can identify with the things that Matt case with my I'm Barry Desmond, I'm the director of secondary education. Same. Sam Smith from Coldwell Hills Elementary. We had what we can do to integrate more into the school. John Zach, Director of Elementary. Bob Francis, I teach sixth grade at Coldwell Hills Elementary. I'm also a technology coach for this one. I'm Matt Dickey. I teach at Henry Welsh. I am a teacher of gymnastics and I am in technology in integration and also in the tech. Uh, my name is Steve Holt, I'm a parent in the, in the district, and I started here from the cookies, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess I'll stick around with the slideshow. But it's actually so like Tom Steve. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Dale Van Aken, I'm a, a parent, a former parent, and a former case graduate from Council Rock, all in the technology areas. Um, I'm a professional <laughs> technologist. Been involved with district technology for I think 17 years, um, one way or another, and uh, I'm here because um, Matt's going to ask me to be here, and, and uh, I was interested in it, so should I? I'm something about you. I'm an director of the school, and uh, I'm a good parent, and I just wanted to see it. I was very excited about seeing change on the field. Hi, I'm Barbara Tiger. I'm the librarian at Holland Middle School. I'm a parent in the district, and I love technology, and I'm excited about increasing our speech. I'm Cheryl Mills. I'm now special to the elementary. I uh, definitely have a passion for technology and mathematics, and a growing passion for speed. I am Holly Woodard. I'm an English teacher at Elm Park North. I'm also a tech coach, and I'm also one of the virtual courses. Uh, I'm a teacher, I'm not the actual virtual course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a field player, but I'm actually an 
instructor of the virtual course. I'm actually here today, all very informed, and actually just happening. Um, but I am incredibly enthusiastic about taking our school district and Mount Arthur High School into the 21st century we are currently on. I'm Rosalie Falchuk, I teach math at South. I'm also a parent of two former and one current student and uh, I'm also teaching Honors uh, University virtually. So I am experiencing this for the first time this year and want to know more as I'm figuring it out. <laughs> Hi, I'm Althea Tomlinson and I teach social studies at Kim High School North. I am also a virtual teacher. I'm teaching the accelerated psychology. Um, I'm actually, I'm here. I'm not a virtual teacher. I'm instructing the virtual course. I'm also a tech coach and I'm also the webmaster for the work. Um, I'm very excited about the technology and 21st century skills for my students. I want to prepare them for what's coming next and I want to do that in my classroom as well as to share with other teachers in the building um, what they can do to incorporate those skills. I'm Ryan Stephen Lopez and I'm a technology integration specialist in the district. I do all the assistive technology K-21 for any kids special needs and do a lot of training as well. I have two students in the district in 7th grade and 10th grade and Matt in my name is Sweet Speakers. <laughs> <laughs> I think there might be another reason. <laughs> <laughs> he misses us. <laughs> I'm Christina Neal. I am PTO um, Communications Chair for the Business and Technology uh, teacher at the Sloan Alternative School. Uh, I also I am the uh, tech coach and the webmaster over there. I have a master's in instructional technology and distance ed, and I was the educational technology coordinator of the Pittman School District before coming. Now you can start. So why are we here? Um, what we're going to do, hopefully, is each of the meetings is going to be about an hour and a half. What I'd like to do is, after tonight's meeting, at the end of the meeting, I'm going to ask you to think about which committee you want to be on, subcommittee. There's going to be two subcommittees. One's going to focus on the technology, the infrastructure, the nuts and bolts, uh, BYOD, one-to-one -one initiative. We're going to move along those lines. The other one's going to focus more on the instructional technology side and um, learning management systems. And we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail tonight. What we're hoping to do is to get feedback from this committee to develop a five-year technology plan for the district. Now, later I'm going to talk about the strategic plan. The strategic plan is three years, but I'd like to plan out a five-year technology plan, and then I'd like to keep it rolling. So as the year passes, we check it, and then we add another year to it, and we keep it as a living, breathing document as we move forward. I'm not sure how much you know about the district itself, so I'm going to give you my perspective from an IT perspective. First of all, I just want to acknowledge Dale and Steve McGill. I've been in the district 12 years, and I've bounced a lot of ideas off those two gentlemen. So 
they were my unofficial technology committee for a long time. I would just call them up and say, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Is it crazy? No, it's not crazy. Okay. So anyway, uh, so the district itself covers 72 square miles. And if you drive from Sol Feinstone to Hall Elementary School, as Gene has done on occasion, it takes about 45 minutes. Okay. We support 18 buildings. Um, there, we have, from an IT perspective, we have about 13,200 uh, customers every day that we support. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we have over 6,000 devices that we support, desktops, laptops, tablets, Chromebooks. We have roughly 200 servers, 500 access points, that's how the wireless devices connect. Over 230 switches, and we support printers and copiers and all that good stuff. Basically, the plugs in the wall, it's an IT problem. You guys have never heard that before, right? <laughs> there are 10 of us, that includes myself. Um, I handle the networks, the phones, um, all the broadcast stuff, board meetings, reporting committee meetings, um, and then all of that good stuff and the high level stuff as well. I have an administrative assistant who also does phone support, adds move changes in phones, she takes care of phones if there's issues. She also does training for the administrators and secretaries on the office products in Adobe. A network manager, and her primary responsibility is backups. She handles the email exchange, and she's responsible for the day-to-day -day desktop support. Our turnaround time on our tickets is about six hours. From the time a ticket's open until it's closed is about six hours, which is pretty good. When I started here 12 years ago, it was 22 days. So we've come a long way. Uh, we have one desktop support person who's also part-time PC repair. So we've gotten to the point where the PC repair only takes up about 0.5 of this time. And then I have a technical communication specialist, and she's responsible for all the website stuff and for the programming and maintenance of the CRTV team. Operational frameworks. How do you run an IT department? I actually give workshops on this for seven hours, but I, I won't take up seven <laughs> hours. Okay, we follow, um, they're basically frameworks. Like if you've ever worked in accounting, you've heard of GASB, and they have these standards that they follow, teachers have frameworks that they follow. Well, IT departments aren't any different. We follow frameworks based on IDLE, the uh, International Standard for Information Technologies and Infrastructure Libraries. It's developed in Europe back in the late 1980s. And it's an excellent framework, and it talks about how you should run an IT department. You should think of it as a customer service organization. So you'll find on the website tonight, when you go home, if you're really bored, um, for the committee meeting website, I posted our service catalog. The service catalog lists all the services that we as an IT department support. It talks about the equipment that's involved in supporting it, and how to initiate the service, and all that good stuff. Um, we also have a big web desk, which is our help desk system. We don't have anyone sitting there answering the phone. Everything is done through a big web desk. It interfaces with our exchange system, and it's real time. So when a user creates a ticket, the ticket automatically goes to the technician. The technician can shoot back the response right away. The great thing about it, though, is it creates a knowledge base of issues, and allows us to track that, that type of for security, we've been following the 20 critical controls of cybersecurity. Really big on security, but I won't worry about that. It's an awesome document. It talks about the things you need to do to keep yourself safe and secure. And then from a budgeting standpoint, I follow a framework called Val IT, which is like COVID. COVID's put out by ISAC, which is a bunch of bean counters like technology, so they put out all these standards. And basically ask four questions. Are we doing the right thing? Are we doing it the right way? Is it getting done well? And are we getting value out of it? So anything that I ever budget for, my budget always based around those four questions. Wow, that's small. Uh, if you're interested, this is the current infrastructure in the district. I've got each school listed, got the number of desktops, laptops, tablets, the number of access points, the number of switches in each building. All of the switches at the high schools are new. Switches at the middle schools are new. I have switches in seven of the elementary schools that still need to be replaced. They're quickly approaching their 13th year. Um, but I do have a, a surplus as I've been taking switches out. So even though they are end of life and they need to be replaced, um, we're still okay if switch dies, we have replacements in stock. So I've been replacing those each year. A portion of the budget goes to replacing switches. So in an organization this large, and it, this size, you can't replace everything every few years. I look for an eight to 10 year life cycle on the equipment. If I get eight to 10 years out of it, I think we're doing pretty good for the infrastructure. Oh. Um, is that including the equipment that PTOs have bought, or is that just with that's just district provided equipment. Okay. PTO equipment, when it's dead, goes away unless the PTO chooses to replace it. Okay. 
Our infrastructure, I know you guys are really excited about this stuff. We use VMware, so we've virtualized a lot of stuff. We have um, basically 123 servers that are virtualized that used to be physical servers. We used to have 16 racks full of equipment. We're down to about six. We're going to hopefully shrink it down to about five. Uh, our core infrastructure, we have a switch that's not as old as I am, but it's pretty old. It's about uh, 10 years old. It hits end of life uh, in June or July of next year. So right now, I'm going to talk a minute about our projects we're headed to. We're looking to, to replace that. We're all mostly Cisco equipment in the district. Um, no one ever got fired for buying Cisco. I know it's a little more expensive than some of the other stuff, but it does last 15, 16, 20 years. It's just, it works. So that's why I buy it, because I buy it for longevity. We have um, about 15 specialized servers that can't be virtualized. The HVAC equipment is about 10 years behind everybody else. So they just got off of XP and now they're on Windows 7. So we're getting there. Um, we have a voice over IP phone system that we put in several years ago. It's a Cisco call manager. I started to augment that with Asterisk, which is an open source call manager. As we've been uh, redoing schools, I've been replacing the phone system in the building with an Asterisk system. It's virtualized and it's free. So I like that and it works very well. All the paging in the, the elementary schools we've done is working really well. For learning management systems, that's what an LMS is. Currently in the district, we're using Moodle. We have Canvas. A lot of teachers are using Schoology, uh, which is free, the portion that they're using, and we're using Google Classrooms. So we have a bunch of different learning management systems, and they're starting to make inroads into blended environments. A lot of teachers are using them more and more. So that's why one of the things that Tom's group is going to talk about is learning management systems. We'd like to incorporate and kind of standardize in the district this size from a resource perspective. I think it makes a lot of sense to do that. So these are the things that I'm planning on spending taxpayer dollars on in the next few years. Um, core switch replacement, planning on doing that next summer. Elementary school upgrades, we're going to continue to do that. Within the next three years, we should have all of them replaced. Yes? Is that the, is that the redundant core switch that you talked about? You did the planning, or is that just the, your primary core? The primary core is going to get replaced with the redundant core. Okay. So you will have, you will we'll have the redundancy. We will solve the redundancy. And anyone wants to know what that means after the meeting, I'll explain. <laughs> We've done the Wi-Fi upgrades at the high schools, rewired. All the high schools are done now uh, for every classroom if we decide we need an access point. The middle schools will be done under the plans that Doug has for the new middle schools. That will be taken care of. I have seven elementary schools left that need to be done. Several of the elementary schools through the last several years, between uh, the principal and the IT department, we have outfitted the elementary schools with a lot of wireless. Um, Hillcrest is suffering, they're behind, they're planning to get done this summer. And I think Doug has one more elementary school on his list he's going to do this summer, and then we'll do the others as we can. Um, see, we're upgrading to 10 gig. The core in the data center will be upgraded to 40 gig, and then there will be 10 gig out of the buildings over fiber. We're doing it at the element at the high schools this year. We're going to be doing 10 gig from the core closet to the IDFs. So we're making the pipe for traffic a lot bigger, so things will be much more efficient. We continue to do the PC refresh. Uh, normally we do it during the summer, but this year we're going to actually change the cycle. What happens is, is we go out to bid in May, we find the machines we want, but then we can't actually purchase them until July 1st. So that gives us a very short window to roll out the machines before school starts. So um, someone on my staff, Gene, came up with this really great idea that if I waited, and didn't buy them during the summer, but waited until April and went out to bid, I could actually buy them in May, and I could start rolling them out the day after school ends, and I don't have to wait until July 1st, so that I have all summer to roll them out. It just makes a lot of sense, and it's much smarter than I am, so I wish I had fun. Yes, ma'am? When you're doing the moving of the data center to the new location, are there any changes that are occurring or that part? Is that something that no, we're not going to change anything. Okay. That would be a really bad idea. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've tried that before. It doesn't work. You want to just move, it over. move what you have. So if there's an issue, you're not trying to deal with, well, is it a new thing? Is it the old thing? It's just one thing. But that's a really good question. I, I wanted to, but there are people who work for me who tell me if I tried it. So no, we're not, we're not changing it. Um, we also need to replace our firewall and our content filters. They need to be refreshed. We're going to try and do that either this spring or start looking at it in the spring. And we'll fit, fit that into the budget where it makes sense to do so. 
And then our virtual infrastructure, we use a product called UCS it's from Cisco with blades. Some of the blades are starting to get old, so we'll be refreshing those. It's much more cost effective in a virtual environment to do it that way. The reason that I picked the chassis that I picked is I can actually replace all the components. In the next 20 years, I can just replace the components. I don't have to buy a new infrastructure every time I need to upgrade something. Now Tom's going to talk to you about our technology. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, before I go into this, first off, I have to thank Shyla here because she did most of the background work on all of this. She created these, what we're going to call them as CRETs, which are the Council Rock Educational Technology Standards. Now, I'm kind of have the boring part of this because all the standards are just going to go up there. Don't copy them down. Don't write them down. They'll be up on the website. This presentation, I believe, Matt, will also be up on the, the website. It will also be on YouTube. So you can stop and read them as much as you want. Mm -hmm. But thank you again, Shiloh. The standards, she had the standards based on ISTE, which is the International Society for Technology and Education, and NETS, which is the National Educational Technology Standards. So she took and read over those, saw what we would like to do here at Council Rock, and put them all together. And I'll show you a part of a page that, uh, from her work that kind of explains it a little bit more. And the common core standards. Uh, the core standards, she broke up into six uh, different pieces, creativity and innovation, communication and collaboration, research and information fluency, critical thinking, problem solving and decision making, digital citizenship, and technology operations and concepts. The first one, creativity and innovation, Overall, students demonstrate creative thinking, construct knowledge, and develop innovative products and processes using technology. And then after that are the, the standards. Apply assisting knowledge, create original works, use models, identify trends, use illustrations in multimedia, and make strategic use of digital uh, media and presentations. The next overall uh, standard was communication and collaboration, where students use digital media and environments to communicate and work collaboratively, including at a distance, to support individual learning and contribute to the learning of others. And again, each standard interact, collaborate, and publish with peers, communicate information and ideas effectively, develop cultural understanding, contribute to project teams, use keyboarding skills to publish writing and interact and collaborate with others. And this one actually had even more. This is probably the biggest of all the standards. Use of the internet to produce and publish writing. Use of the internet to produce and publish writing as well as interactive. Did you read? You did it twice, didn't you? Single setting, OK, and including multimedia components. There should be another one in there. Uh, you did that on purpose, I know. And then research and information fluency. Students apply digital tools to gather, evaluate, and use information. So plan strategies, locate, organize, analyze, and evaluate, synthesize. Evaluate and select information sources, process data, and report results. Critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making. We have students use critical thinking skills to plan and conduct research, manage projects, solve problems, and make informed decisions using appropriate digital tools and resources. Identify and define authentic problems, plan and manage activities to develop, collect and analyze data to identify solutions, use multiple processes and diverse perspectives to explore. Digital citizenship, students understand human, cultural, and societal issues related to technology and practice legal and ethical behavior. I teach at the small alternative school. I would love to try and work this a little bit more for those students. Advocate and practice safe, legal, and responsible use of information. Exhibit a positive attitude toward using technology. Demonstrate personal responsibility and exhibit leadership for digital citizenship. Last but not least, technology operations and concepts. Students demonstrate a sound understanding of technological concepts, systems, and operations. Understand and use technology. Select and use applications, troubleshoot, troubleshoot systems and applications, and transfer current knowledge to the learning of new technologies. 
Now, this is an overview of the very first standard. And you'll see in kindergarten, there's an I, and then in the first grade, there's an R, a P, and a bunch of A's. I stands for introduce. So this standard should be introduced in the kindergarten level. R should be repetitive. A is, uh, excuse me, P is the student should be proficient. And then finally, A is they should be able to apply the skill to different things. And this was done for every single standard. Our mission will be to take those standards that we have at Council Rock and infuse them into the current curriculum. So we're talking K through 12, looking at what we have and what we can bring in. Our charge will be how we infuse these into the curriculum, how will the teachers be trained, how will the students learn, and how will the students be assessed. Now, if, if we're going to break into two subcommittees. Just understand that if you're on one subcommittee, don't think you, you don't say anything to the other committee. The way Matt is setting this up, we have our 45-minute subcommittee meetings, and then we have a group meeting. And we, we share ideas, and we bounce things off of each other. So don't think if you're in one subcommittee, but you really like to do some work in the other subcommittee, you still can. All right? So I just wanted to make sure that, that is clear. And we are up to you. So this year, uh, actually, I think it hasn't I think it's still being reviewed, but it's up for public review. Is the strategic plan. There are three primary goals for technology in the strategic plan. One is technology integration in the classroom. We mentioned that, I think, earlier today. Uh, BYOD and technology infrastructure. So technology integration, we've identified how we're going to roll that out over the next three years. We're going to have workshops, workshops, and I think we're going to have workshops. Um, the reason that we're together as a group is to help formulate what's going to happen in those workshops. What are they going to talk about? What needs to be introduced? How does this mesh right now with the curriculum we have? How do we take some of the phenomenal things that some of the teachers that are here, and one of the reasons they're here, some of the phenomenal things that they're doing in their classroom, how do we get that to other teachers? Does it make sense? Um, I'm not sure that BYOD makes sense to a gym teacher teaching kickball, but I don't know. Maybe he's got little iPads and measuring the velocity. Of the I don't know. Um, but anything, yeah, anything's open, right? So that's why we're here is to talk about that. We want to come up with a plan that makes sense. And now is the perfect time to talk about these things. Okay. BYOD, we want to talk about what are the issues that come out of BYOD. Now, what's interesting is that there are smaller districts in the county, like New Hope, Soul Baron, and Palisades, that have rolled out not only BYOD, but one one issues. And it's worked very well. 1,800 kids, yeah, that's probably going to work pretty well. 11,200 kids, a little bit bigger challenge. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what it looks like. When we started talking about BYOD a couple years ago, we were concerned about laptops and tablets and you know, classroom management. And what we found out was that the number one device kids want to use in the classroom is Holly. The oh, yeah, smart. Smartphone. I never said I didn't feel Sorry. Like <laughs> 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 you're, you're, you're virtual, so it doesn't matter. Right, yeah. yeah. Right here. <laughs> but a smartphone, you know, which is interesting. Kids don't want to bring their laptops to school. They don't want to bring their tablets to school. They have their smartphones. That's what they want to use. So how can we take advantage of that? And then technology infrastructure, obviously that's the kind of stuff that I like. I always believe that education should drive technology. So I want to know where we're headed from an educational standpoint, what the expectations are, so I can make sure we have the infrastructure in place to support it. And that's really what, it, it, in my mind, boils down to. I need to make sure that when you're ready to do what you need to do in a classroom, you don't have to wait four years for me to implement the technology so you can do it. A couple days, please give me a couple days. But I want to make sure that the roadmap there is solid. Oh my god, he's done with the presentation. So, what I want to talk about just a little bit uh, before we start talking about the committees and, and just get some feedback from you guys about how we move forward. On the website tonight, we posted the PowerPoint, so it's there. The agenda was posted. We posted the document that Tom went over, the technology standards. I also posted a document that was developed in 2008, the teacher committee got the idea of technology design standards for the classroom. When we started doing the construction projects, when we started 
before we started Holland Elementary School and Churchill Elementary School, we got a committee together and we developed technology design standards for the classroom. And these are actually based off the University of Pennsylvania, Caltech, and another school had excellent standards. And I was reading them before I posted them. I said, yeah, I think it's time because we still have to pull down the screen in the standards. And I'm thinking they're probably due for an update. So I think we'll, that's going to be under the committee that I charge. We're going to come up with new standards. The other thing that's on there is a the service catalog that I mentioned earlier. But what I'd like to do now is just kind of get some feedback from you guys as far as the committee formation, how that's going to work, and anything that you think we need to cover. Uh, Tom's going to take copious notes. Um, anything you think we need to cover that we didn't mention? All right, Stacey's going to take copious notes. I can take notes. Or what your expectations are for the committee. I mean, does this sound like in line with what you're expecting in terms of developing a five-year plan, working on the different things? Is there anything we didn't touch on that you would be interested in? Susan? The reason I pick five years is whenever I do new technology planning, I pick five years. Five years is theoretical, three years is a probably going to happen, and then one year is that I know about. So when I say five years, this is kind of where we think we need to be in five years. Um, for example, five years ago we talked about new R&D. We knew we had to have a wireless infrastructure plan, so we started planning for it. it. Took a little bit longer to get there than we expected, but we started planning for it. So there are some things that we know in our we don't know. I still think five years is a good model, even though we recognize that five years out, technology may, and something may change. So they may come out with a brand new device like a smartwatch that does everything. Mm -hmm. and, and that changes completely the way that you think about technology. So you're right, five years is a long way out in technology, but I think it's it's a good benchmark for us to aim if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But our, our integration system 
is ready to go. We just have to perform the right and I don't think we should include that. And anything we come up with is that we need to start focusing more and more to make sure this textbook selection process and that part of that process. That's a really good Kindles and you know, it be the format. And it, it sounds like publishers are just not playing their feet. I feel like if, if the districts, the large districts, and maybe at the state levels can, uh, you know, can, can move this with some uh, some serious momentum, we can solve the problem. Okay. To kind of jump in on what you were saying, I actually just recently had conversations with teachers because we introduced to our staff at North campus, the LMS, to see what it looks like. And many of the teachers were using that, they're also using online textbooks that have also built their own learning management-like system to go along with their textbook. And they said, well, which one am I supposed to use, and how am I going to be learning both at the same time? And, and, and felt a bit overwhelmed by that. Um, so I think having a repository of what kinds of technologies the textbook companies and the curriculum department heads are purchasing that could work along with this would be important for the discussion with one of those groups. Um, I think knowing what is out there, because I don't know in every curriculum, I can tell you in social studies what some of the textbooks are out there, but I don't know with English, and I don't know with math, and I don't know with one language. So as different teachers are running into learning about some of the new things that we're talking about and integrating them, I think it's important to know what is it that we already have and what kind of integration does it have with our systems that we're looking for. Very much. What do we go through the textbook review process? Um, in most cases, the uh, teachers pilot the textbook and then have access to the supplemental materials. Um, what, what we find is that although you can purchase only the online version of the textbook, it's only about ten dollars cheaper than buying the hard copy as well as all the online materials. And that's been the dilemma. So what we've gone to is purchasing textbooks that typically stay in the classroom. Students then can access the electronic version of home and have the supplemental materials with those. But we have the same frustrations. We know that you know, the, the online uh, licensing typically we only run three to five years. We know we keep our textbooks longer than that and now there's another additional cost that we need to do. So we're kind of in that um, you know, nowhere land, and we're not big enough as a district to influence. You know, the states like Texas, where they purchase as a state, make those determinations, and that's what those textbook publishers, uh, you know, make their business decisions. A lot of them are stuck with uh, textbooks and some of the materials that come um, through those kinds of uh, processes. So. And I'll just I'll piggyback off of that. Uh, the whole three to five year piece around the, the pure online purchase of the textbook. Uh, the work that I had done in, in, in my previous sister as, uh, as the person in charge of working in construction. What we figured out going across all the different subject areas and in grade levels was maximum you need to be replacing your books every six years. Uh, so if you have a book, any book that is there in that seventh year, that ninth year, that tenth year, which sometimes happens, um, especially given budgetary constraints, you're out of luck because, as Barry said, now you need to sink more dollars into it. So it varies greatly from publisher to publisher, um, sometimes even subject to subject. But six years seem to be that magic uh, time period. And I know with the, with the CNI budget, the Portland Construction budget, that the Westchester Area School District has. There was just no way that the commitment could be made. And I say that as another district that has about 11,200 students, that it is going one to one um, at the high school level. It is going one to one. And even with that, there needs to be a market correction in order for that district to be able to go to uh, strictly online textbooks. So it's a phenomenon that Barry was talking about. It's something that uh, I know that district has seen as well. Is there any opportunity to allow the parents to rent e text that we have in our buildings? That's a good question. I'd like to explore that. 
it is for me to commend the great human and reverence staffing. I was thrilled to see that Shiloh made the scope and sequence matrix go with. And I now see an argument for not having a computer teacher in a basic setting. Or more of a tech integrator person in the district to make sure those are implemented within the one of the uh, and how did you work with your department of ten to the point that um, one of the things that is in the strategic plan is to look at that. We have it there to appropriately assign staff. Um, it's a little open ended the way that we worded it. Um, at the end of the day, it's a budget decision, I think, too. So, what we can do is we can make recommendations, we can put together a plan, we can make suggestions. But at the end of the day, you know, we as a, as a director, I have to look at the budget impact. And then I have to be responsible, fiscally responsible to the taxpayers. I think it was about 30 to 40 percent of the taxpayers have students, and the rest of them don't. So we have to be cognizant of that fact. Um, I do agree we do need some technology integration help in the district, and there are a lot of different ways that we can do that. So I think we're going to explore a lot of options. I would like to see, personally, I'd like to see at least one in every grade, you know, one in the secondary and one in the elementary. Then my brothers, I have one in every building. We'll never be able to afford it. You know, that, that's not really So, but there's a happy medium in there somewhere. We have the technology integrators, or technology managers. Each of the schools have two technology managers. And these are teachers that have volunteered to do at least 14 hours of their time to do workshops during the year. And I can tell you, it's a lot more than 14 hours that they spend helping out with teachers. And that's one way that we're taking care of it. We have a new Smart Day in January, where all of our workshops are technology centric. And we do that internally when we bring outside people in. Is there enough people to do the training all the time? I don't think so. But I think as a committee, I think that's something we're going to explore. And if we can come up with a good, solid plan that's fiscally responsible, then I think that, you know, as, as an administration, we can evaluate it and then hopefully present it to the board and help us out. Yes, thank you. Now, one of the things that I would like to see involved with this technology committee, committee is an authentic conversation about the true change that needs to occur um, within the, the infrastructure of the school. Um, we're going to be asking our teachers to essentially change the way they teach, and yet we're going to still follow this industrial traditional model. Um, and you're saying workshops, workshops, workshops. I know, being in the trenches and being one of those tech coaches that be enthusiastic and pushes this agenda forward, there's going to be a tremendous amount of resistance if we don't take care of some of the needs of the teachers so that they can actually create these lessons regardless of how cool they may sound, how good they are for our kids, and how good they are for society, if we don't have authentic conversation about what needs to occur within our day to day, it's going to not succeed. I'm not sure about the authentic conversation. Okay, okay. <laughs> One of the reasons that I've invited a lot of teachers to this is to make sure that those kinds of things happen. Good. Because you're absolutely right, we can come up with a brilliant plan, but if it doesn't take into account all of the consumers of that plan, so I really want you guys to represent the voice of the teachers, not just the technology manuals, which most of you are, but the ones that aren't the technology manuals. The ones that, when I started the district 12 years ago, we implemented and gave email addresses to all the teachers. I had a teacher send, talk to me and say, I'm not going to bother with it because I'm retiring in 15 years. <laughs> so we had a long conversation that I got her to get his email. Um, but we have to take into account everybody. You're absolutely correct. And, and hopefully that that is something that we'll address. I'm hoping to address that actively. So make sure that we continue to do that. I'm relying on you guys to do that. You should question everything that I say. That's your goal. Question everything that I say. I'm just wondering, is the design standard going to stay the same with the renovations of Colorado School and Big Ten, like in terms of no, they've actually already changed. Okay, I didn't realize. Um, we don't have the full down on the screen. Uh, we're actually what we're doing is. Is everybody familiar with interactive whiteboard? I say that, you know, I'm talking about smart boards and making boards. So what we're doing at middle schools is we're not going to have those. We're going to have the short-term projectors, the Epson projectors that hang above the boards. So now you can actually use the dry erase whiteboard. That's not hidden by a smart board. But what's great about the Epson units that were picked, um, they are in the Central Bucks, they're in Centennial, they're in the Cal States, they've been using them for years. Been over there a dozen times. They're awesome because the software is built into the projector. And so anything you have, it's really cool stuff. And there's not a steep learning curve. 
if you're smart or from your pen, you're good to go. Um, I'm also going to have a couple guest lectures or speakers come to speak. We have a gentleman um, from Pensbury, he's often come. Uh, my, my counterpart over at Pensbury, or Dave Google, is here. And he and one of his teachers are going to come over and talk to us about Google, Google Classrooms to give you guys an idea of what that's about. The former uh, technology integration specialist at the School District now works for Microsoft. And she's going to come and talk to us about Office 365. Both programs we have in the district are available to us. So I'm, I'm looking outside the district for subject matter experts. People with districts about our size that have had successes and failures to come in and talk to us and help give us some insights so we're not trying to just do this all on our own. Does that make sense? Any other comments? Yes, sir. Really out of the wall. But I, I, years ago when I was in college, decades ago, um, you know, we, we talked about you know, big government, big labor, and big business. And uh, over the years, I kind of kept that in my head. And what I learned was that from a macroeconomic view, you had to have those things and have efficiencies. and uh, that type of thing. But at the same time, uh, I was a person living in a steel mill town where a big company, big labor union, uh, used to you know, go at it, and the people who got smacked around most were the individuals and families. Um, now we're in the 21st century, and there's another term that's introduced, which is what I'm not talking it's called big data. And uh, all I have to do is look at Facebook or uh, Medicare anything that's out there, you know, and companies and people are making fortunes uh, on big data. And some people are actually getting paid for their data, and especially in the creative world. And I remember this, this picture of the that they just knocked me out the first time I saw it in the world. And it has to do with intellectual property. And every day, our kids and our teachers generate tons of data. And I know that there are plans all over the place to collect this data. Right? And it's going to be used for two things. It's going to be used for commercial purposes, for designing God knows what, and it's going to be used for research purposes. So we've got to answer questions. It seems to me that it's time for school districts to start protecting the data that they generate, the internet of things, um, whether it's energy use, Traffic patterns, travel patterns, things like that, and think about developing an intellectual property protection for that data, and uh, let it in order to the individuals to create, that, both to teach you, student, administrator, and so forth. I don't know what the possibilities of that are. All I know is every time I read, you know, business pages about something like Facebook, LinkedIn, or Pinterest, and things like that, there. There is there's money here, okay? and we're always struggling to figure out ways to pay for it. And everybody keeps talking about what well, we need in the class jobs, and blah, 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 blah. Okay? But, you know, uh, quick story I was in a movie once back in the 70s. Yeah. I recognized you. No, you didn't. It was always out <laughs> of my shoulder. Oh, but right. I had a speaking part, and that's the important thing. And, and I had lines. And as a result of that, I had to join the Screen Actors Guild. Okay? To this day, I get paid royalties. It's only like you know, 10 bucks that they show it, and that's the gross number. Then. But the point is that for 40 years, I've been making money like that right? because it's protected by you know, copyright and, and contract uh, arrangements between movie producers, studios, and the actors and, and artists who, who do this work. And I think it's something that, you know, maybe it's one of those 10 year things, okay? But I think it's something that. Consider it now as we go forward because uh, otherwise it's, a, it's an opportunity that's that's gone. You know, I think it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure it's going to be the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here, but I'm um, certainly. So it's all cool. Yeah, but it, it, is, it is interesting. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Matt, you know, I live off the wall, so I'm going to add in there intellectual property is actually something that teachers talk about a lot, with, especially if you're building virtual courses. You know, we're building a virtual course and all of the material that we put together is 
general intellectual property? Is that Thompson Austin intellectual property? Do, you know, does Kansas own it? Does Blackboard own it? Who, who owns that? And you know, the hours and hours we, we bleed into our courses. Who, who's is that? And that is a question that comes up. Um, and I think it, it is a question more investigating maybe 10 years or so. I don't know that that's in the five year plan, but it is a, it's a conversation I think we're having. We, um, I'm, at some point. Not to cut you off, but we did have this conversation a couple years ago in fact, And uh, we discussed this at night. Um, I don't know if you remember that or not, but um, there's case law. Basically, you're receiving a paycheck from council or school school district to do to do the work that you're doing. Therefore, the district actually owns the, the stuff that you develop. Now, if you're doing it at home on your own time and it has no relationship to what you were doing on a day to day basis, then it's yours. But if it's in if it's related to what you do on a day to day basis, it's going to be very difficult for you to prove that you're intellectual property as opposed to ours because it is accepted that teachers do work outside of the school on school work. So um, I'm not sure if Mark quoted case law or not to support that. I think he did at the time. But it is it is a very interesting concept, and it does bear further investigation. But I do think it's outside the scope of, really, guys, I don't want to be going down that path. I, yeah. I, you know, it, it's good to make a separate committee. Um, if you want to form one. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll look at my boss and throw it back in his lap. And uh, that's called delegating upward. <laughs> so, uh, we do know it's not hands. They don't know. Uh, uh, one of the things that is possible is um, using technology to um, collaborate with the load. So, whether it's kids talking to kids in the country or teachers, like the peer to peer um, kind of work that you can do to make you know, um, collaboration easier. And for, I don't know how you would copyright any of that. You know, I don't know how many of that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but again, opening everything up kind of makes it easy to come along there. Yeah, there's, um, there are a couple of websites that actually offer open source textbooks where teachers actually collaborate and develop their own textbooks. Um, you know, it's where you go. These are actually textbooks that you can actually print if you want, or it's all online content. Um, and I think it's XTech, CTech, or something like that. Um, fascinating some of the textbooks that are out there that teachers like you guys have developed people in Africa and Asia, and that's where a lot of these textbooks are being used, but they're also starting to make inroads in the United States because publishers refuse to provide electronic copies. And the teachers are like, wait a minute, I know this material. I can take a skeleton of the framework of the book, I can augment it, I can follow the core standards, I'm good to go. So I think that is definitely something we need to, to invest in. So I suggest that's one reason we get the factors purely in the hard copy book for ten dollars when we used to just stop buying that and it was just just an online service, then how is it distinguished from some of these things you're just talking about and that becomes a slip of and mm -hmm. there's some words of directors sitting out the door I hope so. I would also so, add at the elementary level, um, if that's something that we ever um, move towards, I would say we have, we have such knowledge in our district, tons of reading specialists, we have our high school teachers that um, we have the technology and the materials. Um, we get rid of the textbooks, that's my opinion. Um, get rid of the textbooks, give us the materials we need. We can create our own guides that cater to exactly what we need and the standards that we need um, and use that and then I don't know if it saves money or not for something to look into, and we don't have to keep buying textbooks. We can just edit them ourselves and we get what we want. Um, but you do you would need the other supplies, I would say. Yeah, as, as a math teacher, I'm getting to the point where the only time I use the textbook is do these problems, or here's five problems I should do that I probably could have just downloaded off the internet or something or something like that. I rarely use it. Hey, kids, read chapter seven. I don't do it. I think we can get to that stage where we create our own. If all the math teachers in the district all got together, all the algebra ones, let me see your lesson, let me see your lesson, let me see your lesson. Me see your lesson. Bam. You have an algebra one course, and you could probably buy an algebra. So, yeah. 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 Yeah.
first. <laughs> the terminology is different than the lab learned it. And uh, that doesn't come home. They, uh, they <laughs> what did that teach you somewhere? You have to have something to give them. Yeah, it, 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 well, online, yeah. like you said, the LMS. Yeah. Sanjay, that's what you guys did at work, right? Well, well that, that's kind of interesting. I was really but um, so you mentioned one of the ideas. You're trying to make it from the district. Well, and then you could get all out for one teacher just across it. Well, or the, I would not be surprised if the answers to some of these problems is already up to mm -hmm. in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, where they don't have, like, you know, big publishers to deal with the line of the you know, it's almost like this kind of, you know, uh, package that says, look down on you. You know, and that's what it is. Mm -hmm. so, we try to use the word, we try to use the word description. No way that makes any sort of coherent sense to get this part of the post it, which is great awareness. And that one's a big shot on the top basis. So I'm kind of looking, I'm, I'm, I find this interesting because I'm looking at, I've got like my, you know, elementary school parent now, and then I've got this COM to go for it. And, you know, then there's these things pretty, pretty bad. So, one question that I hear tend to be. Your graduates aren't prepared for the real world. Okay. The brilliant kids are they being prepared for the real world. So likewise, we should maybe turn this around and say, how do we reach the science of the answers to these problems to provide? Are we preparing the kids for what they're going to face in college? Right? So if we're working hard for the people, we're working hard if these are our decisions, we can handle this or the other thing. We look around and say, well, what is yeah, so what we're going to do now is just going to hand out forms. And I'd like you to sign up for one committee or the other. Now, if you all sign up for Tom's committee, <laughs> I will not be offended that some of you will be asked to be on my committee anyway. And Tom won't be allowed to let you in the ring. Can I maybe do a draft? You know, I can give you two for a future pick next year. What? All right. Fires. That's the UIOD infrastructure, which Mr. Fredrickson will be in charge of. And I have technology integration. We'll start on this side.
The agenda is more of an outline, so feel free to modify and adjust that in your groups, whatever makes sense. Remember that by May, we want to have an outline of five-year technology. So we'll be moving forward. Uh, Tom Cole and my role will be to three groups to keep them moving forward. So we have kind of a comprehensive plan. I was also corrected on a couple points I made earlier. First of all, the technology integration, the technology coaches in the buildings are given two professional development days work with teachers in the classroom. They're not supposed to be teaching workshops outside of school. They do it anyway, because that's the kind of people that they are. And the other thing that I was corrected on was the fact that I had no beverages and nothing to eat. <laughs> and I was told I am not allowed to do that. If I have a meeting tonight, I have to provide beverages and food. That would be taken care of that time as well. You have to approve through the school. I'm not going to tell him. All in favor of I'm not going to tell him. I'm sitting here hungry. So. <laughs> you received a sign of genius. Can everyone sign up for a committee? That is my question. Has anyone had a chance to sign up for one of the committees? Remember, there's uh, infrastructure, BYOD, so just bring your own device, and then basically the, the backbones of the technology here, and then there is technology integration, LMS, which is more of the, the infusing technology. Everyone happy? I just, actually, I was looking over these numbers, it looks like it's pretty good. Awesome. Are there any questions before we break for the evening? Mike's still on. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.